We're going to talk today about these things. It's a lot of topic. This is a one hour talk, so it's long. You will be rewarded in different ways uh, at the end. And of course, you will be rewarded with the gift of knowledge. Okay, and the gift of not being terrified of the talks you have heard previously, if you are currently terrified. Actually, I can't promise that you won't still be scared after, but it's a good thing to know that these are big tools you're using. We're giving you some interesting power tools this week, and sometimes you have to wear goggles when you use a chainsaw, and this is a similar thing. We're going to talk about the goggles now. Before we do, I, oh yeah, one thing. There's a lot of text on the slides. And the reason for this is that everything I say is also on the slides. And the reason for that is that I will say a lot of things, and I speak very fast, so remember this. We're going to practice this together now. Slower, Johanna, <laughs> slower. Okay. But you also can download the presentation afterwards. Uh, I try to use simple language when I can, uh, because these are simple things, that's why. Okay. Before we start, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about this guy, very briefly. He was a king of Sweden in the 18th century, he's very famous, he was in the end of his, his ended, ended his life being murdered at a masked ball, uh, very dramatic, very epic, there's a famous Verdi opera that is based on this. If you go to Stockholm in Sweden, to the historic Drottningholm Theater, which was built by him and is there, uh, is, remains in its state, you can see in a wall, uh, on a wall in the theater, you can see a painting of a sort of medieval action motif. And I asked somebody there who worked there, what is this painting? And they say, oh, yes, he used to run these sort of masks or pageants where he would stage uh, these very ambitious productions around the castle, because he was into all kinds of performance. Uh, and he would, for instance, play the knight, and they would build like a papier-mâché castle that was like medieval in style, and they would have somebody play the dragon. And once, actually, funny story, he was slaying the dragon, and uh, somebody inside who was manning the dragon got stabbed and died. I don't know if this is true, but this is a very, very, very important historical lesson about LARP design. Sometimes you stab a peasant. <laughs> Sometimes you have a grand vision for what your epic story will be. An epic can be maybe, maybe it's a very intense thing that is happening in one room, or maybe it's something with 2,000 people on horses, real horses, and they're going to ride very far. Like What epic is is different for different people, but you as a game designer have a grand vision. And then you, sometimes you stab a peasant because you lose touch of what is important. Blue star in the corner. Blue star means if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Okay, blue star slide. You get to make the rules as a LARP designer, but you don't get to be the king and the hero as well. If you want to have epic player experiences, don't become a LARP designer, become a LARP or go to other people's games. First lesson of King Gustav III, LARP designer. <laughs> Second lesson. Your job is to make your players be safe, physically and in other ways, and also to feel safe. And this is not the same thing, necessarily, so that they can explore and enjoy your game. If we think about the peasant in the dragon, playing the dragon role, or the actor maybe he was, that individual was not physically safe in the design of this performance or this game. The player, if we say that the king hadn't designed it himself, if I was playing that, that, the, the king or the knight with, with slaying the dragon, I wasn't safe in that as a player because maybe I, I, if I had a real sword and the dragon was made of papier-mâché, I don't feel like I can safely stab somebody because I'm worried that somebody might get hurt. So for me as a participant to be brave in the LARP and to be able to explore situations, I also need to feel that it is safe and my participation will not hurt me or it will not hurt anybody else, again, physically or in other ways that we will talk about now. This should have a blue star as well. Is LARP dangerous? No. Life is dangerous. Life is really, really dangerous. All kinds of things happen at LARP all the time. Torchetti Edland went to Koi Koi in the Norwegian wilderness for a week and they had contingency plans. What do we do if the bears attack? This is true. In Norway, when you LARP in the forest, bears can kill you. And they had plans, safety plans for this. And nobody got attacked by bears and nobody got hurt. And then Torchetti goes home into his home and closes a wardrobe door on his foot and now his toe is broken. Life is very dangerous. LARP is also dangerous because, dangerous because LARP is a part of life. 
we start with general observations. The most uh, basic thing is this. We are animals. We forget sometimes that the human is also an animal. And we have developed from, through evolution. First, we were very simple animals, and then we became more complex animals. And the old versions of the brain, this is like a computer program called Lotus Notes, if you have ever used it. The old versions, the bad versions of your brain are still inside your brain. And then all the new, nicer editions of the brain are on top of it, okay? So you have an old brain, that's your little trembling hamster brain, that is only interested in surviving, and when it's dangerous, it wants to flee or it wants to punch somebody in the face. Maybe it's a very big hamster with a fist. And that's still in there. And those, that brain is faster than the brain that thinks and analyzes and is rational and so on. I don't, I mean, you can take like a basic course in neuroscience this is for this or just go on Wikipedia. It's also fine. But this is basically all you need to know. Remember that reflexes and survival instincts in your players and in you will always be stronger than anything else. Okay? Okay, other fundamental principle, don't be an idiot, is a pretty good rule. <laughs> like, don't put somebody inside an unpadded thing and give somebody a sword, that's just stupid. Don't make dangerous games, don't put a real tiger in there, because it would be interesting. It's not interesting, it's just stupid. Consider the laws of your country. Yes, you may be an artist and everything, but you're still a citizen of where you are and you have to follow the laws and you have to follow common sense. And if you're offensive to the culture where you live, some people will be upset and they don't care that it was just a LARP. You have broken a cultural rule or a legal rule and you may have, that may have consequences in the real world. So start by thinking about that. At the very end of this talk, I will talk for like two minutes about community safety and I'll just mention the most important thing now. Nothing is secret. Okay. If you have a LARP, even if it's just with five friends and there's a camera there or somebody with a brain and fingers to type, this will show up on the internet sooner or later. And somebody will read this LARP, about this LARP out of context and they won't understand what you are trying to do and they won't understand what they, it is and they're going to, going to think that you did something else. So we have to be very careful about what we do and how we present it afterwards and how we present it to people who are not inside our community. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't allow people to take risks. If you make games for grown-ups, by grown-ups I mean like maybe older than 48. <laughs> Maybe older than 25. I don't know. It, that gets older the older I get, right? Uh, you may think that it's, well, at least 18. Let's say at least 18 year olds. Then they get to take risks. In our culture, there are many socially acceptable things that you can do that are very dangerous. You can play ice hockey, you can go mountain climbing, you can play rugby, and, and there are some, or you can be an MMA fighter. And these are much more dangerous things than LARP. And of course, if you want to design a LARP that is as dangerous as ice hockey, and your participants want to play in it, this is not inherently wrong. It might be a bad idea, but you can absolutely do it. Grown-ups can take risks, but you can never take risks for somebody else because then you're stabbing a peasant. You're using your power as a game designer to hurt somebody else, and you don't get to hurt somebody else. That's the rule. We just decide, decide it right now. And you have to take special care with children, non-players, those people who are not participating in your game but who happen to walk past, for instance, and beginners. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. LARP is a form of structured play. And that's why we call LARPs games, even though you could use many other words for what it is. We're playing together. And when we're playing together, you can think of children playing, for instance, more than a theater play. It's more like that. When we're playing together, we're creating something together, something that kind of happens automatically it's not like we have to plan, oh no, I'm going to say this thing and then you're going to say this. Like when it starts, when it, we start, the, the play starts to work, it becomes kind of automatic and slightly magical. But this requires that we're both in it. I can't play to you. I can't play at you. If I go and play at Greta here and she's not participating, it's, I don't know, it's annoying or maybe torture or maybe bullying or maybe just I'm like her little brother. But but for it to be real play, we both have to play together. I can play with you, I cannot play to you. Unless I'm in the theater, which is something else. And I think that this means, me personally, I think this means that you can be forced to participate in something, but you can't be forced to really, truly play. And this may be controversial, but I believe that if LARP is not about play, 
about the thing that happens when we do it together, then it's not even LARP, then it's some kind of weird, like structured activity of other kind, not play. And this is why we talk about safety. Two reasons. One, we don't want our players to be injured in our LARPs because we'd, we, we would be responsible. In some countries we would be legally responsible. In anywhere you work you would be morally responsible, right? But we also want our players to be safe, to give them the bravery to play, to, to participate and to step into that magic circle. <laughs> because we're asking, especially when we're asking grown-ups to play, in our culture it's very rare. Grown-ups don't get to play a lot. It's a big thing to step into that circle. When you played the improv game yesterday, when you started to play, I think everybody in the room was like, Ooh, let's see if this works, because it's exciting every time. Will they dare to play? And you dared to play, and you did it beautifully, and you seemed to have a good time. Yes! <laughs> but you were brave, and you could only do it because you were safe. Now you've heard about some games today that are not fun, fun. Play doesn't have to be fun, but play does require consent, is what I just said, and consent means that it should be mutually, it should be voluntary, not just I volunteer, but we all volunteer to do it together and we keep volunteering, we keep consenting as, the, as it goes on, play is a process. At some point I may withdraw my consent, I don't think this is fun or meaningful anymore, and then I want to leave. And what we're, one of the things we're going to talk about a lot here is how that is possible. Blue star slide, happens now. This is the principle upon all LARP safety, upon which all LARP safety rests. Opting in and opting out. That's a weird word. Opt. It's like option. It's related to that. Option. It means a choice. Choosing to, go, to be in or choosing to be out. Choosing to leave. And I'm going to do this very, very sort of basically. I'm going to give it a little time. Opting in. Opting in is to actively choose to participate in something like a LARP or a situation inside a LARP. I'm already, I've opted into the LARP and then something's happening and I'm like, ooh, I don't want to do that. For all kinds of reasons. Any reason, really. It doesn't matter what the reasons. I don't want to do that. Then I, I'm, I, I, I might say, oh, well, I don't want to opt in, I want to opt out. Or something is happening and I'm like, oh, it's interesting. The, they are going into the other room to hold a trial. I want to be in the trial. I opt in. I go there and go, I volunteer to do, do, do. But to choose to be able to participate, for this to be a meaningful choice, I have to know what's happening. I have to have some kind of idea. I get terrified when somebody says, do you want to participate? I'm from Finland. We don't take to uh, surprises well. I'm like, in what? The Swedes are always like, yes! <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But, I want to know what I'm choosing, and I think we, it, we are ethically bound to tell people what is it we are offering them. This LARP is about these kinds of things, like we're talking about transparency today. Nobody went to Capo, and uh, everybody went to Capo knew that this was going to be about prisons and very, very much about how it was going to work. Same thing with Melanie Himmelha. They chose actively to be there. Informed consent requires information. But you have to know this about opting in. Telling people isn't enough. You tell people they're going to eat clay and they're not even going to believe you. And there are much, much more important examples than that. Fundamentally, we cannot describe, and believe me, I've tried for 20 years, we don't know. We as a community, everybody LARPers, all the LARPers in the world, we're great at making LARPs, but we cannot explain to people who have not LARPed what it feels like why it works, how powerful it can be. We don't know how to do that. And that means that you cannot explain to a person who hasn't LARPed before exactly what they're going to experience. You can tell them what's going to happen, but you cannot tell them how it might feel. And even very simple LARPs can give very strong emotional reactions. Like the hundred first LARPs I went to were probably pretty stupid by my current understanding of what LARPs are, but I loved them and I had intense reactions. And that's very difficult to explain to people. So I wasn't really, like, my consent was meaningless. I, well, actually, I was like, it's going to be fun. And then it was fun. So th my expectations matched the thing. Um, but it's very difficult to get real consent. But if you can't communicate with 100% clarity, what kinds of experiences the players will have during the game, and you usually can't. Then opting into the game is never enough. And probably maybe opting into each situation is also not enough, so you have to have possibilities to opt out. Opting out then is the opposite of this. Opting out means choosing not to participate in something that is about to start or that is already happening. 
And what does this mean? Having the possibility to not participate requires, again, to be able to see it coming. And then there are different things, methodologies of what can happen. Opting out can mean that I can steer the direction of the game in another direction. I'm like, whoa, either like this is going to become a scene which is about bullying, or it's going to be a scene that is about we don't like that person very much. And I maybe don't want to play about bullying, and this game isn't about bullying, so it doesn't matter. I may steer the game into another direction, and everybody else is like, yeah, or, you know, whatever. One person plays the bully and it's like, we're going to bully that person. And I'm like, no, because we're going to go have coffee. And then maybe we go have coffee in the game. Uh, the other thing is to cut the gameplay, to stop. Maybe to say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this. I, me as a player, I feel this is bad. I don't want to participate in this. Can we talk about it? The different methods for doing this. Or to leave. Either to leave the situation inside the game or to leave the game entirely if you're uncomfortable with what's happening. But it's not enough that you have the option theoretically. Like any of you could stand up and go out now. But you know, everybody would look at you, you and be like, why, they hate her, I would think. Oh, they hate me. Actually, maybe you just need the bathroom. And for Charles, who's sitting there close to the door, and Nina, it's very easy to slip out. Uh, for, let's see, Lasse, who's sitting just behind the projector in the middle of a line, it's hard to slip out. Y you can if you want to. <laughs> right, so there's, it's not just like, oh, but you can leave, no, but it's, you can live, of course, I can always live I'm, if I'm not tied to a tree. But was it socially possible for me to live? And that is just as important for you to design as the other thing. Now, you have all already tried, a, I think, pretty well designed opt-out mechanism in the dance game. The standing by the wall. When you didn't want to participate in the gameplay, you could go to the wall and stand there as yourself, as the player. We workshopped this before. That means that we practiced as ourselves. We went around and said, hi, my name is Johanna. We talked as ourselves, and then we as ourselves practiced to go stand by the wall. So that that is a skill that we players all have. Because also when you're leaving the fiction, you're kind of transferring from the character to the player. So if it's good that the, that the character can live, but it's especially important that the player knows how to live, right? We had practiced that, and it didn't feel super embarrassing to go stand by the wall, I hope. Maybe for somebody it still did, and then that's a design flaw. And also visually, this was a good one, because it, in this case, people are standing by the wall. So it didn't disturb the game of the others at all if somebody was standing by the wall. It was almost like it made it feel more like a disco. That's good design for this particular game. <coughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more at the end about how some more ways about enabling opting out. But first we need to talk a little bit about role playing. Ooh. Well, maybe the most important thing is, I'm not sure I answered the question, why do we take more care with beginners and children and non-participants? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? They don't have a real choice. Like, they don't have the information to make an informed choice about whether they're participating or not. And community safety, if you're not participating in a LARP, what's happening can look pretty terrifying, and they might call the cops on you. So, <laughs> so that's also important to think about. Uh, you've seen a couple of definitions of role-playing already. I'm going to throw another one here. <coughs> role-playing is characters acting in fictional situations with interesting emotions plus fictional social relationships between them. So interesting emotions can be things like love, boredom, anger, fear, shame and so on. Note that the characters are fictional, but the emotions are not fictional. When you're experiencing, like you can pretend in a LARP, sometimes you're not, sometimes you're kind of pretending, that's totally okay, that's a totally okay way to LARP, but quite often you become so immersed into the character that you're actually feeling the emotions of shame or anger or fear or boredom. Oh, boredom is a great design tool, by the way. Making a, your characters and players bored will make them so grateful when something happens. <laughs> <laughs> but but and, and the re you're, you're feeling these emotions in your body because, again, emotions are chemical processes inside our bodies, also other things, but they're also that. And the player has the same body as the, as the character. Uh, and that means that the emotions are real, even though what they mean is not real. The situations are fictional, but the emotions are true. And the social relationships inside the game, inside the game, they are real. If, you, if we say that Greta is my sister, and then we all, for the rest of the week, we behave as though she is my sister, effectively, for the duration of this week, she will be my sister. She's not actually my sister, she will stop being my sister when we stop the, the LARP, for instance. But while the game is happening, the relationships are real. This is important for the following reason. 
there's something called the role play contract. This is like an idea. The idea is that to be able to LARP at all, we make a, a, a secret agreement. We don't say it out loud, but it's, it's implicit, is the word. We have an implicit, implicit agreement that to be able to play, we promise that we will not judge the player by the character, and we will not judge the character by the player. And we also agree that the actions inside the game will not have the same consequences than they would off the game. So if I betray my sister Grete in the game, when we go to lunch after the game, we can still be friends. Okay. The problem is, well, it's not a problem even, I just want you to know and understand that this agreement is not literally true. We pretend that it's true. We agree that that's what it's like to be able to play, but of course it isn't actually true because our emotions go inside and out from the game because that's why LARPing is fun. We do feel these feelings. It is actually exciting. That's what makes it meaningful. So if we didn't feel those feelings, LARPing would be completely pointless. So we pretend that we are not affected by the stuff that's happening inside the fiction, but of course we are. We bring stuff in to the game and we bring stuff out of the game. And when this happens accidentally or on purpose, that's what's called bleed. And bleed can be a super positive, we can bring in positive things or we can bring in negative or, or complicated things and out as well. Bleed is not harmful. If I read a novel and I have a strong experience and I take something with me out of this novel, it's not harmful, but it can still be meaningful or strong. And this is the same thing with LARP. Uh, in our culture though, we have a strong level of understanding of what kinds of effects we get from movies and, and books and comic books. But we don't have a big cultural understanding of what kinds of effects we get from LARPs. Only LARPers know about this, and even we only learn by doing it. So we can be surprised at how intense the emotions are, and that can be a little bit scary. Players don't always react with the strongest emotions to a, a game like Capo that we talked about this morning. Because if you go to a game like Capo, you have a pretty clear idea of what's going to happen and what kinds of situations you will be in. And, and then you can prepare for that and all of the other players are prepared that somebody might have a strong reaction and there's a place that you can go and the people who are, who are ready to give you a hug and chocolate and everything you need. So that might actually be okay. But I, I do want to, us all to remember that we can't predict which LARPs give the strongest experiences. I have a friend, a woman, who loves intense games, like the, the harder the better. If you can put her in ice water or tie her to a tree for hours, she's like, yes! And she had always done very well. Then, then she went to like a very friendly, happy Harry Potter LARP with like fantasy school, and just completely friendly, almost no conflicts, all about love and wonderfulness. And she was playing the cook in the kitchen and she only had one little tiny storyline because she was actually cooking, uh, which was like a little trivial sweet love story. And it was like a game that was a lot about hugging, basically. <laughs> but the nicest possible thing. And then that love story completely accidentally reminded her of something that happened 15 years earlier in her life that she hadn't ever quite dealt with, like some kind of heartbreak or something. And she got so broken down. She had a huge emotional reaction. She had to stop play for hours and hours and go away and cry and think about her life and stuff. This is <laughs> completely unpredictable. And she always talks about this, like how strange. I went to Capo and nothing happened. And I went to Harry Potter and played a little story about love. And I'm like, oh, it's so hard. And and I'm not mocking this because we don't, like, sometimes that happens. I cried when I saw the movie Independence Day when the president's wife died. I'm sorry, I'm really <laughs> embarrassing. It's a very bad movie. But it pressed some kind of button and I think it's the saddest movie of all time. So we, these, things, these effects are completely unpredictable and we can't protect ourselves from them. But it's good to know that they might happen no matter what your LARP is about. Okay. But many kinds of LARPs are designed on purpose to create strong emotional reactions. Kapo was designed to create strong reactions in the players. Melan Himelohav was designed to create strong emotional reactions in the players. I think the improvisation dance game that you played yesterday was designed to maybe like be fun. I think that was pretty much the goal there. And then maybe somebody could have had a strong emotional reaction, but it's statistically relatively unlikely. If you do it on purpose, it will happen if you know your shit as a designer. And then you need to think about that. What are you going to do with these emotions? What is the story that you, around the game and together with the players, what are you doing this for? 
you don't need to protect players from emotions, in particular if the game is about getting them these emotions. I mean, and that's why they're signing up for, because they want the emotions. That's really important to think about. And one side effect is probably that, that some people will have emotions that they didn't want. Some people went to Kapo and it was awesome and very uh, good learning experience. Some people went to Kapo and they had a bad experience, but they felt after the fact that it was still worth it because they had learned many things about society and about power and about bullying and about themselves. So it was a meaningful thing. It was not a pleasurable thing, but it was a good thing to have done. And some players went to Kapo and had a really shit experience and they don't feel that it was worth it. And maybe if you make a game that is that intense, it's inevitable that some players will have a bad experience and they will maybe think that you are a, a turd or that means a pile of poop for having, for having designed a game like that or for having made them think that they might have a meaningful experience and then they didn't and they might hate you for it. And then you have to think before, not after, you have to think before, is it worth it? When you're making a game like that, you're taking a risk that maybe a little percentage of your players, of course the goal is that everybody will have a meaningful experience, that's what you're designing for. But it's not a foolproof system and if something goes wrong, is it worth it if somebody hates you? Or if the newspapers write that you're an idiot and you're doing, what you're doing is dangerous, that might also happen. And then it doesn't help that you know that it's not. You have to think whether it's worth it. Why are you making this game? If you're making it to become a very famous LARP designer, that's a bad reason. If you're making it because you think it would be really super cool to have 2,000 people on horses riding very far and then the tiger attacks, that would still be a very bad reason. If you're doing it because you and the players feel that this experience will change them in a positive way, maybe it's a political thing and it will make the world better somehow, or it will make me a better human being to have experienced this, or more empathetic or something, it might be worth it. But you have to decide that for yourself, and the players have to decide it for themselves, and then you have to have as much information as possible about what you're doing here. For the dance middle school game, not so much of these issues. You don't have to think about this so much when you do LARPs that are about those things. Then you only have to think about the accidental effects. Okay. The most common strong reaction after a LARP is sadness. And strangely, even after happy, cuddly, uh, we're all the gummy bears LARPs, people can still be super sad. And here are some of the reasons why. We have grief, that means sadness, about the loss of the fictional community. So when we're inside, and I have a sister called Grete, and in, or well, called something else, played by Grete, and in my real life I don't have a sister, and actually maybe it was amazing to have a sister, even though she betray betrayed me a little bit, but we, we sorted it out in the end and she didn't do it on purpose and now we love each other for life. That wasn't real, but I had that relationship, and when the game ends, I'm never going to have a relationship to my gummy bear sister again. And it's okay to be sad about that. It's completely normal to be sad about that. And maybe you need to tell your players that that can totally happen. And it's fine. And it's a good thing. It means they had a positive experience. But sometimes in my, my real life, maybe I'm super stressed and lonely and I don't have a lot of close friends or my job is meaningless. And then I go to a LARP and I get to do something meaningful. And all of my relationships are intense and beautiful and, and, and great. And then I come back and I look at my own life and like, I want to be in there. And then I'm really sad. Again, this isn't your fault. This is because life is sad, okay? But, the, but this, is an, this is an effect that LARP can have, and it's good to be aware that that might actually happen. Many games that are awfully hard to play are awfully hard to play because they tell you things about the real world. If you play Halat Hisar, which is about the occupation in Palestine, and I'm, I don't know if you've been seeing the news, I can't even, like, I'm just gonna cry. But, but, the world is a really awful place. And if we use LARP to tell stories about how awful the world is, well, then we're going to come out of the game. And if it was a good game, we will understand that the world is a terrible place and we will be sad. This is good sadness. It's good if you can help the players do something constructive with their feelings. But that is your goal. Your goal to do this is that they should be sad. Damn it, the world is terrible and we need to make it better. And first understanding that it's sad is a powerful emotion. That's good sadness. But to the players, it may be personally very hard. And then they may be like, yes, they are suffering over there. But right now I'm sad 
and my sadness is important to me. Well, it is, yeah. And you need to acknowledge that it is important. Of course, I, the LARPer who went to the LARP, which was rough, I'm suffering very much less than people who are actually experiencing these things in real life. But my sadness is also important, and it's good if I get some tools to do something constructive with my sadness. And then there's perspective on my real life that happens in LARP. It also happens if you go on vacation. Some people go into railing and then they come back and then they are like, I will change my life. I'm going to just skip my education and become a police officer. That happens whenever you're removed from your ordinary situation. And that can also happen in a LARP. And it can happen pretty fast. You can go for, to a three-day LARP and you come back and you have gained a perspective because for three days you were not thinking about yourself. You were thinking about some completely different thing and your subconscious has sorted things out and then you come out and you're like, wait a minute, I hate my husband. <laughs> then you should probably wait a little bit to see if you still feel like that two weeks <laughs> later or two months later. But you might have felt like that all the time and the only thing you needed was to go away a little bit and like not think about that. So that might happen. Um, yeah. And the others have been talking a little bit about this uh, earlier this morning, about the roles that we play in our real life and inside the fictions, and how these are somehow similar and they are somehow uh, the same. And one of the ways in which the real world and LARPs are the same is that, well, I said before, if we all pretend that, that my gummy bear sister uh, is Grete, then I have a gummy bear sister and that's wonderful. But of course, that's also true in real life. Like, for instance, right now you're pretending that I'm the lecturer and that you're the students and that's why you're not just like talking to each other and screaming uh, straight out. These are also social roles. It's like an agreement. We agree that right now I'm the one who's speaking. Okay. Um, this is also true in all of our friendships and sort of off-game relationships that we have of different kinds. We have all kinds of roles that are interacting all the time. And to, to feel like myself means that I am just living my life and all of you are treating me as something that's pretty similar to what I feel like. Like I'm a Finnish woman who cares a lot about LARP and then when you see me, you talk to me a lot about LARP and not so much about ice hockey, which I don't care so much about, for instance. And then I feel like myself. But if all of you would start to treat me like I'm an idiot and, and a fool, that would be bullying, by the way. But also, that would, that's also painful because it doesn't match my understanding of who I am. And though in the worst possible world, it makes me feel that that is actually who I am. You can change who I am by how you treat me. Right? That's why bullying is a terrifying and bad thing. After the LARP, sometimes, there's a little side effect which is that maybe we don't know each other so much and we come to the summer school and then we are always in these lectures where we don't talk to each other and then we LARP and we have great LARP experiences. But maybe we never spoke to each other as who we are for real. So we have a lot of real and intense and interesting relationships that are fictional, but we don't have a lot of real relationships. And how do you treat me after the LARP? I mean, this is a bad example, but maybe like we went to a week-long LARP and we only met five minutes before it started. And and then we had a very interesting sister relationship. But after the LARP, I don't know you at all. I mean, I like you and I trust you and I know we can play very well together, but I don't know what your job is and I don't know that your name is Greta. And that can make me sad and terrified. And it can be very unsettling because first, I feel a little bit like a gummy bear still because I was that all week. And all of you are treating me like I'm the president of the gummy bears. And in real life, maybe I'm like a very nerdy sort of shy writer and I'm very terrified of being a leader, and you're all treating me like I'm a leader, and there's this weird dissonance happening. And that can be very uncomfortable. And sometimes it can be super uncomfortable because maybe I was the villain, I was the evil bear, and all of you are a little afraid of me because I was really good at being evil. And the that, those feelings, the fear that you felt in the game bleeds out of the game. And me as a player, when I come out, and I'm like, la la la, I want to hug, and you're all hugging because you're all the good bears. And then you're like, oh, there she is. And then you're like, hi. Because it's not your fault, it's a normal reaction. But you don't know who I am, you only think, if, then you have to think that I'm the evil gummy bear because you've got nothing else to go on. So, one of the things that we can do, um, yeah, we've been speaking about this. Uh, one of the things we actually can do, which is really easy, just make sure that all the players have some social relationships before the games. Often when you have workshops before the games where different things are happening, this makes the LARP really good and it makes the group feel good about the, each other and they creates trust and they can workshop their characters and their culture and all of that. And that makes the LARP better. So the people who love workshops say. 
I think that the main reason why it makes the LARP better is because we already have existing relationships as the real people, and then we can be the fictional people, and then afterwards we can come back and we can go back to like, oh, it's Lasse, and, and I'm trying to see whoever names him, and there's Maria right there. And, and that we can have these relationships where I don't have to be the evil gummy bear anymore. And you also remember that in real world I actually have a brother, because I spoke about that before. All right. It's an easy, easy thing to do, which will help your players a lot with feeling there is the magic circle and here is my real life. Also, sometimes after the game, it's very useful to do summaries or reflections or debriefing or de-rolling. And there's going to be a whole session later in the week about that. I'm also going to mention some things later, but basically just know that you will get to try methods this week and we will have a whole lecture about how to do that later. Okay, so much for emotional safety. Now, physical safety. Erland was uh, covering some of these things before, and it made me very worried. I'm like a security Nazi. When you all went to play, I had to send Erland over. I had to go to the bathroom, always top priority. But I sent Erland over to the place over there with the, where the smoke is coming from, just to check that it's not on fire, because I don't want us to die in a fire. It wasn't on fire, they're smoking fish. <laughs> But I care deeply about this stuff, and so should you. So the first stuff is all the creature comforts. We need oxygen. We need to be warm, but not too warm. We need a place to sleep, and it's important that we do sleep. We need water, a lot of water, a lot more than you think. Even you who are organizing the LARP, remember to drink, because you will become stupid otherwise, literally. Temporarily, but literally. Bathroom, 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 bathroom. Last week there was a game in Norway that a lot of people have mentioned called Koi Koi. I wasn't there. But a lot of players from Denmark went to Norway. These are neighboring countries. It's not a long distance. What the Danes did not know is if you're on top of a mountain in, the, in Norway, even if it's summer, even if it's a heat wave, it gets cold in the night and you cannot sleep if you only brought a sheepskin and a blanket. I'm totally in game, I'm fine with a sheepskin and a blanket, I sleep outside all the time. No, you don't. You don't sleep outside on a mountaintop in Norway. <laughs> also, they have bears. <laughs> you have to tell your players this. They don't, all the Norwegians know, because Norway is all mountains, so they know this. But, like, Finns don't necessarily know, Norwegians don't know, Palestinian players probably don't know exactly what it's like to be on a mountain in Norway, just as I don't know what it's exactly like, like how, how hot does it get in the summer in Palestine? I don't know, I've never been. I can guess that maybe a little bit hotter than in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> but I, how much hotter? I don't know. And if you're in Finland or Norway in the winter, if you don't have good winter gear, you will get ill. But more importantly, if you sleep, if you fall asleep in the snow and you're not warm, you will die. <laughs> if you get cold, you will die. And Everybody in Finland knows this, because we're taught when we're teenagers that we can't drink too much in the winter outside, because the risk that we will pass out in the snow and die is very high. So you have to have a friend there who's less drunk, so that you know you're, that whole thing. <laughs> um, so everybody knows this, but, but you have to tell your players, because you can assume that they, know, they don't know. Nobody knows anything. Prepare your players always. It's not dangerous to be in Norway in the winter. Norwegians are there all winter and they're just fine. <laughs> Life is dangerous, right? Okay, so, but it's dangerous for me, maybe, because I've never been on a mountain in Norway in winter, so I need to prepare, and it's your responsibility as organizer to make sure that everybody understands exactly how they should prepare. Violence in the game, even if it's pretend violence, alcohol, real alcohol in the game, Often it's done, but often it's a really bad idea, especially if you're on a mountain in Norway in the winter. Uh, there are so many, because, not because people can't handle it, but because it increases the risk of accidents. And is your game in a place where you can get real help real fast? Maybe, maybe not, but if it isn't, probably you should have a plan for what happens. Are you in a place where the ambulance is a helicopter, but the helicopter can only fly if the weather is good, and accidents only happen if the weather is bad? The players should probably be allowed to make up their own mind. Tell them before they get there. Because I assume, I live in a city and I'm not an outdoors person at all. So I always assume, of course you can get an ambulance anywhere you go. And the Norwegians are like, no. <laughs> but again, you have to tell me. So I get to decide, am I willing to take this risk? It might be worth it, maybe not. When you LARP in cities in particular, but when you LARP anywhere, uh, there's always world overlap. 
my fictional world overlaps with the real world. There are people at Ruta who might see you LARPing through a window accidentally and maybe you're doing something that looks really weird. Maybe I'm, we're doing something running around in a building with play guns and a neighbor happens to see through the window because the light is on in the city and they call the police and that's a reasonable response. And then you have to have a plan for what to do when the police comes. And traffic happens. You may be in the forest and you think, well, this is a forest road, there's nobody, nobody here. Yes, there might be. There might be a car that goes really fast because there's nobody there. And then you might, I mean, it's really it's basic things, but you do have to think about this stuff. Physical pressure as a tool. Hunger, chill, dirt, lack of sleep, these are powerful design tools, but you should use them in moderation. One of the best LARP experiences I ever had was when I was a witch in a fantasy thing and they had real buildings and the buildings had some space under the floors and I crawled in, it was raining, and I was spying on somebody in the building and I crawled under the building and I was lying there and all the water from all the drain pipes was running just straight through me and I was soaked wet and it was so cold and I was physically listening to a secret meeting that was happening inside the room and I was cold and it was a little bit boring but it was also the most exciting thing that has ever happened to me in my life, I think in game or off game. And then afterwards I couldn't get warm and then it stopped being fun um, but there were like there was there were ways to solve this in that game so it didn't matter so much but but these are these can be powerful like to do something with my body especially if you're from a culture where we're not very used to doing things with your body like carrying something really heavy quite far awesome <laughs> for the first hour maybe two hours hours four to eight not so fun but still so, so use this wisely it, physical pressure is a great design tool up to a point Slight pressure can simulate strong pressure. If you drink just a little bit of real alcohol, if you're a person who drinks, of course many people are not, but if, I, if uh, all the players drink and you drink just a little bit of alcohol, it, it can become easier to pretend that you have drunk, had very much alcohol. Or if you're just a little bit cold, it is much easier to pre pre pretend that you're freezing to death. All right? But all of this must be an active choice by organizers and by players. And Everybody's always going to say, it's going to be fine. It's not fine, so you have to make it okay for them to change their mind. Maybe if you're an organizer on that mountain in Norway, you bring some extra sleeping bags because people will be idiots and they'll be like, it's fine. And then you can give them a sleeping bag and say, put your blanket over it so it doesn't show. This is especially important if you have unexpected design choices. Maybe you're already in a LARP culture where a lot of your players are LARPers and they have an idea of what kinds of things can happen. If you do something totally different, you have to tell them because otherwise they can't prepare. Johanna, who's sitting over here, once was a co-designer of, of a game called Luminescence. It was played in Finland. It was based on an, an art installation, but it was in a room and there was a thousand kilos of flour uh, on the floor, meal, the thing that you use to bake bread. That's quite a lot, by the way. And then there was some light and things, and everybody stripped down to their underwear, and then they played that they were cancer patient, patients in a hospital. And this makes more sense if you talk to Johanna. <laughs> but in, in the sign-up to this game, it said, this game, they didn't say, they didn't reveal what, exactly what the method was going to be, but they said, this game cannot be played if you have asthma. And I have asthma, so I was like, that is so wrong and unfair and la la la, why can't it? And they're like, we can't play it if you have asthma because you will die. I'm like, oh, okay. So I didn't go to the game and, and that's good. And it's sad because it seemed it was a really good game apparently, but, but that's a, an, an uncommon design choice. Maybe if you have a, a game where everybody will only eat nuts because in this culture we only eat nuts, you have to tell people beforehand because some people are allergic to nuts. Uh, especially if you have a game mechanism where like the, the way you become more strong or the way your relationships becomes deeper is you eat nuts from each other's balls. Like if you don't eat nuts, you can't play the game at all. So then it's extra important that you maybe make sure that everybody is okay with this. Yeah. There's a point in your career as a LARP designer when you will feel not everybody does this, but most people do, so have I as well. You start to feel that the more intense I make this thing, the better it will be. And maybe you have players who are taking the same journey with you and they're like, yeah, we can do more intense LARPs, let's do more intense LARPs. I, every, and then everybody's like, we're going to make a super intense physical game with like simulated torture and we're going to have love stories and all of the love stories end badly. And uh, we're also not going to have any opt-out mechanism. You can't leave when you're in, you're in. And we all agree that this is a good idea. No, it is not a good idea. 
Even if you all agree, even if you're all 27 years old and you think that this is a good idea, you are wrong. I just want to say that. And then you, I'm not going to stop you, like you're grown-ups, you can do this, and it's going to be a bad idea. And some people may feel really bad, and also everybody will hate you after, because they're going to pretend that it's your fault, even though they were totally into it before. That's being a game designer. Suck it up. Sometimes you will have the exact same conversation, but you're going to be like, and we're going to do all this, but we're going to have opt-out models. Like There will be ways of stopping the game or, or leaving the game, so it's going to be fine. No, <laughs> it's probably not going to be fine. Usually there is not, like, you can use these designs, you can make games that are totally really hard on the players, but usually that is bad game design. Usually that completely distracts from what you're trying to communicate. What is this game about? Is this game about enduring stupid ideas? <laughs> if the answer is yes, well then that's probably a good game design. If the game is about anything else, you're completely distracting from what you're trying to do and having an awesome experience. Like, it's not that cool. If they want to do something really get dangerous and physically hard, they can go climb Mount Everest. People do that all the time and then they can die there and it's not your responsibility. It's very sad and I don't think they should, but they do do that and that's socially acceptable in our culture. If you make a LARP that is that dangerous, I don't even know, it's never been tried in the legal system, but you could possibly be put in prison and maybe you would deserve it because it's a bad idea. <laughs> okay, and there's a serious note that has to do with this uh, and I'm going to mention this again later. Uh, if a player becomes completely passive, if they stop responding, it might be for two reasons. One, they may be LARPing somebody who just disassociated and became completely passive and they're not responding. or they may have a serious problem. If somebody faints at a LARP and starts to shake and a little um, foam comes out of their mouth, it may be because they're LARPing very convincingly that they're having an overdose from drugs and maybe that's appropriate to the game. But it may also be because they're having an epileptic seizure. And if you don't know that some players have epilepsy, especially I mean, the organizers might know but they're not there, if I, this is a real example, this latter thing, it has happened to me. I looked, at, I saw this happen and people were like, you know, oh, he's overdosing, no, no, no. And I was like, I th it, it looked like his head hit pretty hard when he fell, damn it, I don't, I'm not sure he's playing. You have to have a mechanism in the game where the, whenever there's any kind of doubt like that, the players cut the game. It's very, very important. And it's almost the most important, because if a person is, is having this issue, you can go there and you can ask very discreetly, I'll mention some methods later, you can check with them, off game, are you all right? And they're gonna go, yes, and continue. And then you're fine, then you know they're just playing very convincingly. But if they're not responding, you cut the game immediately. And all of the players there are responsible, all of the organizers are responsible, all of the players who are participating in a game are responsible for this together. And you have to talk to your players about this, that it's everybody's responsibility. And if somebody goes passive and they're not responding and you're checking in with them, then it's very important that you don't say, are you okay? And they're gonna say, yeah. Because that, that might still not be okay. This happens very, very, very rarely. I've never seen it happen at a LARP, but other people have. Somebody has some kind of serious thing that happens to them, and they're maybe in shock, or in trauma, or something like that, and, and that might happen. Like, it's incredibly rare. It almost never happens, but it does sometimes happen. And then you need to have a way of dealing with that. And the question is, how do you check in? Um, and the way, one of the answers is that you, you ask a question that cannot be answered with yes or no or just one word. You say, off game, can you describe how you're feeling? Because if you're in real problem, for trouble, you cannot answer that question. It's too complicated. And then you know that you can cut or just take that person out of the game and get them help. Okay. I mentioned that it's not rare. I mean, it is rare. Uh, it's much likelier to happen in an intense game. And it's much harder to spot in a game where a lot of the players are like playing trauma victims, for instance. That's going to make it harder for you. So maybe don't make a game where people are playing trauma victims. Or maybe make a game where they are playing in a culture where if you're suffering, like the more you're suffering, you're doing something specific. Like in this culture, when I'm suffering, I do this, I hit my forehead with my hand. So if somebody's really suffering as a player, they're not going to hit their forehead with the hand and then you know that it's real, you know? Um, there are so many methods already invented for simulating things that are dangerous in real life that you don't probably need to invent any, but you could go and invent some anyway because it's fun. If you want that the characters in your game can have sex, as we said, you can have a pen 
a pencil and a pencil sharpener. That's a very abstract method. There are others that are much more physical to play those kinds of scenes. If you want characters to be fighting in your game, you probably don't want the players to be fighting for reasons mentioned before. And there are, you can, they can fight theater fight or they can fight full contact, low impact. That means that it looks real, but they don't hit hard. Bad idea, but can work sometimes. Um, and there are many methods for this and you can talk to any of us later if you're interested in games about this field. Supernatural events, invisibility, very difficult to do for real life. Flying, very difficult to do in real life. For all of these, you also need other, other methods. Uh, often it's fine with the social agreement. We say, if I do this, it means I'm invisible and you pretend I'm not there. You can totally do it because you can also pretend that we're gummy bears and sisters, like this isn't harder, right? But there are many, many methods for this and it's, and it's good to like, use them. But think about what the effects of using them are. They will give you more safety, but they will affect your game design in other areas. But sometimes methods are very not intrusive, and sometimes they're very intrusive. Sometimes it disturbs the atmosphere of the game, and sometimes you go stand by the wall and it looks like you're still in the game, but you're not actually in the game. That's not intrusive. Um, the simulation might create danger if you have uh, explosive, for instance, you have magicians who are throwing fireballs and then you're the, when the dragon dies there's going to be a fire tower of like 20 meters of fire shooting into the air. That might be dangerous if you don't have professionals doing this, also illegal. Um, I was at a LARP where that happened and they uh, were using a new technology which was much less dangerous than all of the ordinary fire uh, pyrotechnic equipment. But they didn't tell the players that they were using another technology. So everybody among the players who understand about pyrotechnics and explosives were freaking out because these fires were really close to us and they were like, we're in real danger, we have to cut the game now. And then uh, it turned out that we weren't actually in danger, but the organizers had forgotten to tell us what they were going to do. Like, they could have just said, oh yeah, by the way, if you see fire, as long as you're 10 meters away, it's fine, it can't burn you. It's not real fire or something like that. But they didn't tell us because they thought it would be a cool surprise. <laughs> no such thing in game design, pretty much, like a, a, a character can have a cool surprise. A special effect can be a cool surprise, but the methods that you're going to use, the kinds of experiences that will happen in the game are 99% of the time not a cool surprise. Too much player enthusiasm. Players love the game, they play really well together, they become more and more physical because they trust each other and it's awesome and then you lose control of what's happening in the room. That's hard. Yeah. You probably can't stop it. You have to think about, am I causing this or not? Uh, and if it is, you go in, if you feel that now, this, now these people are playing dangerously, go in and cut the game. Maybe they're going to hate you, who cares? It's, it's your game and they're being dangerous. You cut the game, you give everybody time to calm down, you give them some coffee and some hugs and some, some sugar and then you take a little break and go out and get some fresh air and then you go back and continue the game where it started and it's fine. Lack of sleep impairs judgment. It impairs concentration, it impairs cognitive skills, it can create hallucinatory states, it takes long to recover from and it makes people emotional and sad. <laughs> Lack of sleep makes people stupid and sad. Can you give us an example about in-game escalation? Yes. Um, yes. I don't have a lot of time, but I will. Uh, I was at a game where we had decided to use a method of fighting where nobody ever touches anything and it's all about physical posturing. It, we workshopped a lot and the group trusted each other so much. In the first hour of the game, somebody shoved somebody in a fight. Everybody were like, whoa. And then we looked at each other and we were like, okay. And then from that point on, nobody used the battle system anymore, but we were really physical with each other. That was stupid. And I should have cut, or the organizers should have cut. Nothing bad happened. But we didn't play with the rules that we had agreed on. The players changed the rules without the game master's control. Yeah, lack of sleep, really bad. Um, you can't decide, design a game where people can't sleep. And people will love the game and they will want to play all the time you have to force them somehow to sleep. This is very difficult. As far as we know, there are zero cases where LARPing has caused psychological problems. But for people who have mental health issues, LARPing, just like many other things in life, can be a trigger, especially if they don't get to sleep. 
And for people who have not previously had any mental health issues, if they don't get to sleep, that might actually hurt them. If you have a friend who does have mental health issues and you go to LARPs with them, if they're very ill, maybe talk to them about not LARPing then, maybe talk to the organizers, maybe stop them from playing if they're really in a bad place. But LARPing might also be really good at curing or like making us feel good about stuff. Nobody knows. I'm not saying it does, like nobody knows. Um, but if people say it's dangerous, that is not based on science or experience. LARPs do trigger mental health issues like depression, especially depression, also financial problems, in one group, which is LARP organizers. Every, of the, let's see, how many experts in the room? Uh, can the experts put their hand up. Okay. Now, every expert who does not know at least one LARP organizer who has hurt themselves with making LARPs, put your hand down. Okay, nobody put their hand down. This happens a lot. You have to take care of yourself and you have to take care of your, each other because you're making big culture projects on no money and that's very, very tiring. Okay. For the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about stepping out of the game. It's important that the magic circle is clear somehow, that the, that the limit, the borders of the game are clear. When am I in the game? When am I not in the game? It, they are typically clear, you usually know, but you can make it even clearer somehow um, by, for instance, putting a, some kind of ritual, like when we go into the game we play a song and when we step out of the game we play the same song, for instance. Or when you leave this room, you're the player, and when you enter this room, you're the character. Those kinds of things, you can make it clear. It's also important that you can step out of the character, be in the game, but like sort of check out and be like, are we okay? And then go into the game again. Or like step out, use a meta technique and go into the, to, to it again. Also, this is not just because, because it's a safety thing, it's also because again you might need to use meta techniques or players might need to go to the bathroom and vampires don't pee, so there's no good in-game time for a vampire in a vampire LARP to go to the bathroom, but the player might still need to go to the bathroom, so you have to enable this somehow without the fiction completely breaking. I'm now going to run through very briefly some useful methods for different ways of stepping out of the fiction. We're going to practice them as well. You, you all know this, the hand, gray, hand thing. I raise my hand, you all raise your hand. This is the same, except I yell hold. We're going to try that now. I yell hold. If you hear me yell hold, you also yell hold. Hold! Hold! Okay. And now if somebody in the next room heard you yell hold, they would also yell hold and so on. If I'm in, you can have a rule in your game that if somebody is in immediate physical danger, like I'm about to fall off the stage, you yell hold, and that means also everybody freeze and yell hold, and then you look, am I the one who's in danger? And if you're not, you're like, who is in danger? And how do we do this? And then you continue. That's one way of doing it, okay? The off-game rule. Whenever somebody says off-game, whatever they say is not in the game. Off-game, are you okay? Can you describe how you're feeling? Off-game. I just got a message from the game master that we have to go there. Okay. Ping pong rule. I want to check in with somebody like really discreetly. Uh, it's not nothing like that looks like a real emergency is happening, but I'm like, are we okay? I can say ping, and like in a in a fiction where nobody would say ping, I can go ping, and the other player goes pong, and then I'm like, okay, and then we can continue playing. That doesn't work if the player becomes entirely passive, right? So for that, you need different questions. The off-game room, like in Capo, you go somewhere and then you listen to your music and you eat some chocolate and somebody will give you a hug. Also a great place to plan with the other players what kinds of interesting game directions the game could go. The cut-break rule. Cut means uh, pause the game. We're stepping out of the fiction and talking about what's happening here. Break means, whoa, I'm uncomfortable with what's happening here. We, can, we have to slow down or change direction. Somebody is about to be bullied in game and I say break and then we go in the other direction. Okay? This does not work if you don't workshop it before. You can talk to any of the experts about this. Eric Fatlad would be the best. Sometimes players don't want to break out of the game. They don't, want, they don't want to step up out of the fiction. They might be curious about what's going to happen, or they feel that it's going to be embarrassing, or something like that. Or they want to stay inside the network of the fictional relationships. These are all really bad reasons. 
the pauses make your LARP better, but not pausing makes your LARP worse. And here are some things about enabling the opting out. Ask yourself these questions. This is a blue star slide. I forgot the blue star. Is it necessary for the fiction that all characters are present in all situations at all times? If the answer is yes, it's a bad design. Is it physically possible to leave the game space? The answer has to be yes. Have you workshopped the break and cut rule if you are working, if you're using them? Answer has to be yes. What is the social cost of pausing the fiction for yourself or for others? You have to be aware of this. Sometimes in educational LARPing, students are forced to participate because they're LARPing in school or something like that. How do we make them opt out well? I don't know. I hope Carolina and Eric will talk about that later in the week. Um, and what we design is not just the runtime of the game. It's not just when we're in character and that whole part. It's also what's happening before and what's happening after. That's part of the game design. I mentioned some things today. Uh, we also already talked about this. And there's going to be a whole session about debriefing and what, what you can do after the runtime of the game that's happening later in the week. And I'm just, uh, these are all covered there. And here's my last minute. Who is your LARP community? I would like for you to look at each other in the room, backwards and forwards. This is one of your LARP communities. Your biggest LARP community is everybody in the world who feels that they are working with LARP, that what they're doing is LARP. Your smallest LARP community is probably the people that you are making LARPs with and the people who are playing them. And you have a responsibility to all of these people to not get us in trouble and to not get yourself in trouble, because we like you very much, okay? It has to do with public perception. How people think about what LARP is in your community and in all of the other communities because of the internet, it affects us all. If LARP is in good standing, then we can get resources, we can get time. Our, our husbands, if they're not LARPers, can let us take vacations to go to the summer school and teach, and so on. This is important for all of us. And different locations and societies have different tolerances for fiction and play. If you're going to play in the a LARP that happens in the streets and you're not going to disturb anybody who's not playing, that's okay. But don't do it in Jerusalem. And don't do it in Washington, D.C. And don't do it outside the U.S. Embassy in Stockholm. Because the police will come and they don't like you playing there. And in other places in the world, playing everywhere is completely fine. And you need to think about where you are. And I think that what we're doing is making the world more playful. We're uh, increasing the tolerance for play, and we're expanding the idea of play as something that we can use to change the world to be a better place. Thank you. <laughs>